Hey, this is Derek, and listen to Skepticality, an official podcast of Skeptic Magazine, for Tuesday, March 13th, 2012. <laughs> Science. Welcome once again to Skepticality, the show which provides you with news and interviews from leading skeptics, scientists, experts, and people from all walks of life for the promotion of critical thinking and science. It has been a while since someone out there has sent us their own science shout out. So, if you want to share your love of science with the world, please send us a recording of yourself or anyone or a group which you know can convey the love of science in audio form. You can send those audio bits to our email at hosts at skepticality.com. We look forward to getting more of those on the air. Since it happens to be yet another episode of Skepticality, I must turn once again to my buddy, Tim Farley, so he can let us know all about the skeptic history for this moment in time. It's time to spend a few minutes in skeptic history for March 2012. I'm Tim Farley of whatstheharm.net and skeptools.com. Each edition, we look into history to remember key events of science and skepticism. This edition, we've got kind of a random walk through some of the history of bad scientific observations. Critiquing pseudoscientific observations and conclusions is a core activity of skepticism. Now, of course, any scientist can simply get a measurement or observation wrong. Catching that is part of the function of replication of results. But skeptics know there are many more subtle ways that observations can go awry, making replication impossible. One way is to use a non-scientific notion as a premise for an experiment. That was one of several things wrong with an experiment famously reported in the New York Times on March 11, 1907. Dr. Duncan McDougall set out to prove the existence of the human soul by carefully measuring the weight of humans and dogs at the moment of death. He found humans lost weight at the moment of death, but dogs did not, and he came up with the figure of 21 grams as the weight of the human soul. His experiments had many, many issues, but among them are the ideas that the soul would have a measurable weight and that dogs don't have souls were preconceived notions based more in McDougall's personal religious beliefs than they were in science. As a result, any measurements he did were kind of bound to be random. And yet, the 21 gram figure has become a bit of a meme, even serving as the title of a major motion picture. Another way scientists go wrong is allowing their subjective observations to be primed by other information. Priming is a psychological phenomenon in which people are more likely to notice something or engage in a behavior right after thinking of a related idea. One of the most famous examples of priming led to the 19th century idea of life on Mars. Born March 15, 1835, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli made detailed observations of Mars. In those pre-astrophotography days, this consisted of carefully observing through a telescope and drawing pencil sketches of what you saw. This was naturally an error-prone process. Schiaparelli wrote of canali on Mars, literally meaning channels or linear structures, but some English translations used the word canal instead, which added an unintended connotation that they were constructed and not natural. American astronomer Percival Lowell, born March 13, 1855, picked up on this connotation and became enamored of the idea of life on Mars. His drawing showed the same canals and other features that he said proved the existence of life there. But as it turned out, neither the channels or canals or many of the other features 
actually existed. They were all optical illusions or simply poor observations recorded in the pencil sketches. But once Lowell had been primed to see canals by Schiaparelli's work, he was bound to see them. Another way to foul up an observation is to simply not understand your measuring device. Of course, the many ghost hunting teams spring to mind here, but I'm thinking of an even more peculiar claim that dates from March 19, 1994. That's when Jose Escamilla claimed he first photographed what he calls rods. These supposedly paranormal worm-like flying animals are only visible on photographic recordings. But really, they are just a product of Mr. Escamilla's lack of knowledge of how modern video and digital cameras operate. They aren't paranormal at all. They are simply blurred multiple exposures of entirely normal insects. And finally, of course, a key failure in pseudoscience is often to fail to recognize viable alternative explanations for what you have observed. That's a key element to the Phoenix Lights UFO incident, which happened 15 years ago this week, on March 13, 1997. Although this has long been explained as the result of a well-documented military exercise in which several A-10 aircraft dropped flares at night, UFO enthusiasts have repeatedly discounted that explanation for various reasons. The bottom line, of course, is that truly reliable scientific observations are not easy. Skeptics know this, and it is important that we communicate it to the public. There's another 15th anniversary this month, aside from the Phoenix Lights. It's a bit more somber. On March 26, 1997, the Heaven's Gate cult committed mass suicide in a home outside San Diego. I've previously mentioned the history of apocalyptic cults on Skepticality number 124. We also have a 30th anniversary that just occurred last Saturday. March 10, 1982 was when the catastrophes predicted by the book The Jupiter Effect were supposed to occur. Of course, nothing happened on that date. I talked about that on Skepticality number 130 and number 150. And so ends this edition of Skeptic History. Links to additional material, as always, will be provided in the show notes. And you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook under the name Krelnik, K-R-E-L-N-I-K, for a new Skeptic History fact every day. Seems to be a good time for we skeptics and science-loving folks who enjoy reading more about the science behind why we all just seem to be such illogical and flawed creatures. What I like is how, even though the topic seems to be the same, each new author or researcher has different ways of explaining and highlighting these flaws, and how we might serve ourselves better knowing how to navigate the buggy software we all have installed in our skulls. When I was sent a movie trailer for the latest book by this week's guest, I had to run out and get it, and then bug him to be on the show, and let us know more about himself and what led him to set out to produce such a book which is so focused on skeptical topics and yet so darn accessible and fun for the general public. David McBrainy is a journalist and fan of science. According to his own website, he attempts to make his findings easy to understand and fun for anyone who is interested. He even explains on his website that if you think something he has stated is wrong in his book, website, or blog, to please let him know so he can make appropriate edits or additions. I think all of us would agree. It would be grand if all journalists thought the same way. Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy were both assassinated by a man with three names, 15 letters long. John Wilkes Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald. Neither killer would make it to the trial. Both men were shot on a Friday, sitting next to their wives, Lincoln in a Ford Theater, Kennedy in a Lincoln made by Ford. What are the odds? Why do deaths always seem to come in threes? 
How did the basketball make it in there from all the way across the court? Why did the tornado spare the church? Some things in life seem too amazing to be coincidence, too odd to be random, too similar to be chance. When you desire meaning, when you want things to line up, you see patterns everywhere. Order makes it easier to be a person to navigate this sloppy world. You're born looking for clusters where chance events have built up like sand into dunes. Picking out clusters of coincidence is a predictable malfunction of a normal human mind. And it's just one of the many ways you are not so smart. Hello, David. Hey. <laughs> so I was uh, looking at some of the parts uh, about your book and on your blog, and somebody said that you are a self-described psychology nerd. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I went to college thinking I was going to be a psychologist, but um, I sort of got uh, – I fell into doing uh, – writing for the school newspaper, the college newspaper – and that, that instant gratification and the you know love for writing made me just it was so uh, it was so appealing that I ended up uh, wanting to write more than I wanted to go to my psychology classes. So I ended up uh, moving my psychology to a minor and, and writing for a living, and that's how I've ended up here today. But I never lost that um, that love for the epiphany. Uh, head spinning sort of thing that happens to you in a good psychology class where you keep being, uh, your beliefs keep getting challenged and your sense of self keeps getting squished lower and lower. So uh, uh, it ended up being the sort of thing that I would talk about at, at parties or at get togethers or just with coworkers. And I would say, well, actually, uh, that's called confirmation bias. And we that ended up becoming the sort of thing that I, I tried out a lot of different kinds of blogs over the years. And, um, when I just sat down and wanted to write a blog about something very narrow and specific, it ended up being this world of uh, self-delusion and all my psychology background came back. And it was really helpful and uh, it's been really fun to explore that sort of stuff. So what came first? The Well, obviously the blog then for, came first before the book? Yeah, I uh, started the blog about three years ago and it started out as one of those sort of um, – I, guess I would call it like a junk food kind of thing. I knew I wanted to talk about one specific topic and make that just psychology and self-delusion and the, uh, and research into that sort of thing. And like the first post on the blog was the infamous Invisible Gorilla video that uh, gets passed around YouTube. Oh, yeah, we, we all know about that. Right. And uh, we I was just sort of hopping around to different topics and – it went from the inattentional blindness and change blindness to things like learned helplessness and placebo buttons and pareidolia. And um, the more I wrote about these topics and the narrower I, I got, the, uh, the, more, the longer the pieces ended up becoming. And I started really actually pulling in lots and lots of research. I'm, I'm lucky because my wife is a librarian and she's able to get me uh, – any study I, I, I want whenever I'm doing research. And so I can pull directly from the studies instead of having to depend on uh, web research. And uh, the longer they got, the more of an audience I was able to, to get and the more of a mainstream audience I started to get. And uh, I've learned, I've somehow stumbled into being able to pull these sort of, not only is it stuff that the skeptical uh, movement is finds appealing, but I've been able to, slip under the radar and, and go into the mainstream with this blog uh, and talk about these topics that usually get uh, don't get as much attention to a mainstream audience. And the actually a very strange thing happened uh, to the word, the way that the blog became super popular was I got into an argument with some friends over uh, which was better the PlayStation three or the Xbox 360. And uh, it's one of those uh, internet arguments that no one's going to win so, uh, and I sort of became a, a, a really knockdown, drag out, long, stupid fight over stupid things that I felt sort of ashamed about. And I wanted to, I asked myself, why would I, why would I become so, um, 
devoted to being right about something like this. And since I had already had a blog going about self-delusion, I thought it might be a fun thing to explore brand loyalty and fanboyism. And so I wrote an article about uh, fanboyism and brand loyalty, and that happened to come out about the same time that the iPhone was stolen. And the and Gizmodo asked if they could republish that blog post, and that ended up bringing in a huge audience. And from that day forward, I've had a large audience of people on the blog, and that uh, translated to getting a book deal. Very good. That, so that's how everything came about. It was through somebody stealing an iPhone. Yes, uh, I'm thankful for someone stealing an iPhone. Uh, and it came about because uh, I think like a lot of good work, when you start to uh, – when you stop talking about just um, – when you stop, stop commenting on, on external things and actually go internal and try to expose your own um, – failings and your own uh, uh, tendency to fall prey to bias and fallacy and such, uh, it makes for a lot better writing. I think people were able to connect to that better. So yeah, I noticed that this book does a really good job of describing most of all the logical fallacies that most skeptics cling to, for mainly for a general audience. Um, is this your way to remind us all that we're, you know, we're deluding ourselves minute <laughs> by minute so we don't feel bad about it? Well, um, I think, you know, when you get down to it, I am an example. I'm an, I am a success story for the skeptics movement when you come to, you know, get down to it. I came from a very religious uh, background. I'm from South Mississippi. Um, I, was a, I didn't go to a great high school. Um, I was, my family's pretty, uh, a lot of my family's pretty intolerant. And I have a, a dad who is deeply embedded uh, in believing in and conspiracy theories from Ken Hovind to everything else, right? Uh, so I have, I was get, I grew up getting it from both sides and when you, uh, navigate that culture and you start to come out of that shell and, and, and develop, uh, a critical thinking, an attitude of critical thinking and you start to, uh, you know, glom on to the outreach of science like uh, Carl Sagan and, um, uh, C. Clark or subversive uh, entities like George Carlin and Bill Hicks, that sort of stuff, the Discovery Channel, Nova Specials, all that stuff helped pull me out of that world. And it's informed the way I write because I try to write uh, these topics in a non-threatening way that will uh, touch people who are in my position as a younger person or maybe uh, someone who's never seen these topics before. I tried to design the book to be something that a skeptic or an atheist or a science advocate or hopefully all three would uh, they could hand over to their mom or dad or cousin or boss and not feel awkward about it um, by being fun and, and funny and also being more of an introduction uh, and an overview. I hope that it can um, it would be like a giant spoonful of sugar, which I think is kind of missing from a lot of the, the books the skeptic movement champions. I would imagine if you saw this book in the shelf at a Barnes and Noble, I was about to say Borders, but that RIP <laughs> on that one. Um, but yeah, so when you see the the book itself, it looks like a fun book, really, because of the way it's laid out. I mean, this is it's the you're not so smart, and it has none of that premise of being this I don't know stuffy, you know, science book, but it is. In a way. Yeah, I, I, I pull a bait and switch in a lot of ways. I, I, I'm hoping that the person who walks in is looking for a book like Why Do Men Have Nipples or um, so maybe the, like Uncle John's Bathroom Reader or something like that. Yeah. And, then they, and then they grab this book and they start to uh, read about um, just world fallacy and hindsight bias and uh, uh, the anchoring effect and things that are – well known to people who are either students of psychology or economics or in the skeptics movement, that sort of thing. But uh, to the uh, unbeknownst uh, layperson, this would be a great way to um, slip this in in a way that is, is non-threatening. Because I never really men mention uh, religion or political ideology. Or I never attack religion or political ideology in the book. But uh, by going to the premises that underlie that sort of the sort of thinking that ends up in those worlds. I think it's uh, and I because I get I get email and I get letters and I get responses from people who uh, and I know I have family members and and friends who 
um, are very religious or are very, very, um, you know, have deeply conservative views on certain things, and they totally get the message of the book and don't realize that it may be undermining some of their convictions. Yeah, I was wondering because that's kind of the thing I got to take away from this was it never really focuses on one specific type of person pretty much ever other than a couple of spots where it's not really ever focusing on a person. It's more focusing on, I guess we would say bad behavior or things that just don't seem logical once you learn about them, like the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's like, you know, I mean, there's a reason now why I know why uh, American <laughs> Idol and they keep making more shows like that because, and that's one that a lot of people don't really think about, even the skeptics movement, we don't talk about it very much, but that's, it's a big thing. It's like, well, that, why do people keep going back for that over and over again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I listen to, uh, I'm a recent, uh, I mean, the Skeptics Movement has done a great job of outreach, I know, because I'm one of those people who I had, I was enjoying science, and the science had done a lot for me, uh, of getting, breaking me out of those uh, old paradigms of thinking, but it wasn't until I found some uh, skeptical podcasts and started uh, getting the books that were recommended there that I realized there was this whole other world of people who um, who just come right out and say, no, these things aren't real. There's a, there's a word for that. There's a term for that. This has been researched before. Um, but it, it is something that I still notice coming up uh, in the skeptical movement. There are a lot of things that we all still fall prey to because you really can't excise these things from your mind. You can't not experience confirmation bias. You can't not uh, fall prey to the Dunning-Kruger effect. So that's that's what makes um, this so fun to write about because there's nothing I've written about so far that I can't say, yep, I'm doing that every day and it's a constant struggle, um, especially with Dunning-Kruger because uh, I try to use it, a video game analogy in that as well because it's sort of uh, the difference between going from level 0 to level 10 like in an RPG or something is so fast that you assume that going from level 10 to level 20 would be just as fast and level 20 to level 30 would be just as fast. But it's, um, you know, it, learning, be, becoming uh, experienced in something and uh, whether it be playing the guitar or uh, uh, being, being educated in a certain topic, it's, it's more of a logarithmic process where um, it's the more you learn, the harder it becomes to reach expert level. And that's just not something we sort of intuitively feel. Like it's when you pick up the guitar and you first start playing it, you think, um, man, this is really difficult. I can't, uh, I don't know how anyone does this. And you learn a couple chords and you learn a couple songs and you think, oh, okay, well, this actually is really easy. Uh, just another month or two and I'll be as good as uh, anybody out there. And um, that's sort of the under, underpinnings of the Dunning-Kruger effect is uh, you don't realize how far you have to go to become an expert. And there, that's how you end up with people, you know, on American Idol thinking they can actually sing, you know, Freddie Mercury. Yeah. You know, you, uh, you grow up in a, are you, you, um, uh, move around in an environment where, uh, you might be the best singer, you might be the best, whatever. And you don't realize how far you have to go to actually compete with people who are, who are better than you because you haven't been exposed to it. And I know that I know from personal experience, I know I have friends like this who, uh, think that, um, they know everything there is to know about, um, say, uh, um, evolution or uh, uh, you get into an argument with someone on Facebook about uh, climate change or whatever, and they assume that they know as much as someone who's been studying this their entire life. And it's, uh, it's a weird phenomenon. Yeah. And then start talking about Facebook, you even have a whole book, a part of the book, which kind of relates to Facebook about Dunmar's number. In a way, it's yeah. Uh, when I was writing that, that, that was one of those things that came from the blog. Uh, since since writing that, Dunbar has uh, put out his own book, which is really cool. Um, but it's, it's uh, and what I write about in Dunbar's number is the tendency for some people in social media to try to gobble up as many um, friends as they can, and then uh, basically they it, it display that as a form of social. Um, Jewelry, but like a lot of the topics I write about, it's a way to get into the topic of um, um, Dunbar's number, which is 
that Dunbar says that because of social grooming takes mental effort, uh, you can you can only really keep up with about 150 people, and that's not really how many most, most people do not even keep up with 150 people. Much much fewer uh, than that. The the reason is to actually uh, care about a person, uh, keep secrets with them, pay attention to reciprocal altruism with another person, to um, know their history and have them know your history, and depend on them to maybe um, give you a ride or help you move that sort of thing. You have to engage in social grooming, just like uh, a pr- any other primate would. To if you were a, an ape, you would be picking insects and stuff off the other person's back. But we go to each other's Super Bowl parties or just talk on the phone or that sort of thing. And that sort of social grooming takes up a lot of mental effort and takes up a lot of time. And so naturally there is a plateau to how much effort and time you can put into it. And it it comes out to be around 150 people. Also, I noticed that there is one, one of these fallacies or parts of the book that I think, as you mentioned skeptics, I think we all tend to fall into the third person effect quite a bit. Like, <laughs> and I read that, that section. I was like, you know, I think we all, I, I see this like almost every day, at least three or four times or more about how people we disagree with must be the stupid ones or the gullible ones. Yeah. Um, that the third person effect, and it goes well, but there's a couple of things on the blog that I've written since the book that sort of explore this even further. Uh, the illusion of asymmetric insight and the backfire effect both play into this. And the third person effect, the easiest way to describe it is saying, um, is sitting in, let's say you're sitting in a, uh, in McDonald's and you're like, and you see people around you eating and you say to the person with you, I can't believe people eat at McDonald's. It's so disgusting. And no, you're in there eating the McDonald's, uh, uh, people tend to, to see themselves as uh, not the sort of person that advertising is geared toward, not the sort of uh, not the sort of person who lives in their town, not the sort of person who lives in their country, even though they are that sort of person by just being there. Um, they're just a contingent of that, and the uh, that especially plays into say advertising, where you say you know, advertising doesn't work on me. Every com- you see all these commercials, and you're like, "Oh God, this is so stupid. Why do people fall for this? I can't believe people fall for this." And then you know, you ask yourself when you're faced with the choice between one version of a product and another, uh, what's what's motivating you to pick that thing? Probably the advertising. Uh, you uh, in the book, I talk about you. Um, maybe you see an ad for. Um, uh, a soft drink or a type of, or a, a fast food item over and over again. And every time you see it, you're like, God, this is so stupid. Why did they do this? Who would fall for this? But then one night when you, uh, you leave the, you're, uh, coming home from the bar and you're ravenous and you think, Oh, what am I going to get? The, that's when that, uh, advertising will sway you. So, um, people tend to believe that their opinions and decisions are based on, um, on facts and that other people's opinions are based off of lies and propaganda and that um, you're impervious to the lot to lies and propaganda. But really you just, uh, we each have different vulnerabilities from each other. Yeah. Cause you even mentioned in there that most of us are, even if we think we are, we're not non-confirmists. We pretty much all are confirmists in a way. Yeah. You conform to what uh, agrees with your sense of self. What, what matches your concept of the character that you inhabit? Um, what promotes your self-esteem? So uh, that all plays into um, self-perception theory, which is what I've, I'm writing about now. Uh, my current writing is all about self-perception theory. Um, and that is, you know, the idea is that you have, when, if you become, do you promote social issues because you're a Democrat or are you a Democrat because you promote social issues? And the research is uh, leaning more toward that the groups that you inhabit uh, have more effect on you than you have on the group. And the, um, the narrative that you spin is uh, more a, a example of um, attitude follows behavior, not the other way around. I find it interesting that we all kind of believe the opposite or we not only don't believe it, we tout the opposite. We're proud of the opposite, even though we're part of it. 
Well, I mean, um, no one wants to see themselves as a conformist. I mean, everyone wants to feel like they're an individual, at least within the culture I'm in. Um, and it's, it's self-esteem building to see yourself as a, um, a glorious and, um, and intelligent, um, thoughtful individual. And if, um, if there's someone out there who wants to play on those desires and can, is able to satisfy those desires with a product or a group or a message, then uh, people like ourselves will be, um, will be more likely to uh, gravitate toward that sort of thing. Uh, and I know that it's um, the more, you know, I, you, the, the character that, I, that, you know, that you, a lot of us create is the, someone who is um, intelligent and, um, and, and is a critical thinker. And because of that, you're, um, there are actually products out there. There are actually movements out there. There are actually websites and other things that are geared toward people who see themselves that way. And so they know that whether or not it's by design or just sort of that's how the chips fall, that's going to be the sort of thing that a lot of us uh, gravitate toward. It kind of explains how Facebook got so big, I guess. <laughs> I, you know, um, the the great thing about Facebook, well, when it comes to social media, a lot of social media is self-presentation, and um, it's like everyone is in their own reality show. Someone said that recently. I don't remember who it was. Uh, we all get to be stars in our own reality show, and that's what social media helps do for us. Um, but I, I think that it makes sense. When I saw a timeline roll out recently on Facebook, uh, it played, it, it, it connected with me, the idea that we are, um, so self-perception theory again, which is the idea that, um, you tend to, when you don't, um, we tend to observe our own behavior and then after the fact, make up a story to explain it. Um, and that sometimes that story is close to the truth and sometimes it's just something that makes us feel better about who we are and what we've done. Um, if we look at what we've done and it, and it brings up anxiety, it hurts our self-esteem or makes us think that we might be ostracized from our group, then, then we'll have cognitive dissonance and that goes down one path where we you try to rationalize and go through some mental gymnastics to reduce that cognitive dissonance. But if it doesn't raise your anxiety, it goes down this other path where it just becomes, an ex you just create an explanatory narrative that... Um, you believe, and it becomes part of your personal narrative. It becomes part of yourself. And timeline on Facebook is a great example of giving someone a modern tool to engage in a behavior that we that we're doing all the time. You can actually write your own history. You can create a narrative that says, "This is who I am. This is what happened to me in the past." And we tend to do that uh, from moment to moment. I wonder if, when they put that into Facebook, I wonder if they uh, thought about it that way. I don't think so. You know, it's like, just like, uh, I think a lot of, it's like confidence men, magicians, um, uh, advertising, all these things are, um, sort of have their own natural selection where what works moves on to the next generation and what doesn't work gets, uh, thrown away. And at this point, after, you know, a hundred years or more of, of, uh, engaging in those, um, uh, professions or in uh, the five or ten years we've got into social media, what we're, we're stuck with a lot of things that have worked. And I think what usually works are what things that play into our tendencies to fall into uh, bias and uh, um, fallacy and, and just uh, and create personal narratives for ourselves. So I, the, more, the, the longer something has time to play in a environment of selection, the closer and closer it will become to... Um, to matching and, and fitting in with our ways of thinking or ways of perceiving. So before I let you go, what is your favorite fallacy or thing that you've seen others do all the time that really you latch onto and think, I just love that even though it's terrible. <laughs> uh, I mean, confirmation bias is, is always going to be number one. And I'm really thankful that um, this recent surge in um, pop psychology books has put that out there into the public uh, consciousness. Um, but my favorite thing is something I wrote about after the book. It's on the blog. It's called uh, The Backfire Effect because I'd never heard of it and it's fairly recent. Um, but that is when if you engage in an argument with someone over something that, uh, that they find that's really close to their personal beliefs um, and you bring them evidence that 
shows what they think is incorrect, instead of uh, the person moving closer to the truth, they will move farther away from it. By presenting evidence to the contrary, you will actually cause uh, some people to dig in their heels and believe even more in the uh, thing that's incorrect. That is a crazy, crazy thing that people do and dependably do in research. Must, be ex must explain why climate change denial is so big. Yeah, every argument that I think a skeptic would find themselves in, especially in a, in a comment uh, under a story or in a forum or on a, in social media, you're going to see the backfire effect just fly out of everywhere because um, people, when, they're, when their deepest uh, convictions are attacked, their instinct is to dig in and, and double down their beliefs instead of going, hmm, yes, actually, that's a very good point there. I, should, I thank you for edifying me, sir. Um, and that's much less likely to happen. And you have to, if you know that's going to happen, it can really, it's very helpful because you can avoid that sort of arguing because it's not going to get you to the result you're looking for. So what would you suggest then? Well, uh, humor is uh, always the best way to go about it. And um, what I find is really helpful is to actually take on the other person's viewpoint and uh, demonstrate its absurdity. Um, I guess sort of the Stephen Colbert approach, where if you actually play out the incorrect viewpoint to its logical conclusion, it is on its face absurd, and that's, that is helpful. Um, and the other thing is to remember, uh, just to stay sane, remember that a lot of these things take a long time to change in the public consciousness. Um, one conversation is not going to change a person's mind. Uh, one article is not going to change a person's mind. Because when you present evidence from the Internet, the first thing that someone does who doesn't want to believe that is they're going to go to the Internet and find evidence to the contrary so they can, they can soothe over that, that disgusting feeling. They just got a feeling like they are uh, incorrect and that their worldview is, is off kilter. So um, just remember that it takes a while. And hopefully um, this new movement that's around, I hope the skeptic movement is aware. I don't, I'm not sure if it is aware of this, uh, the two systems movement that's taking place. It started with Daniel Kahneman in 2002 when he got the Nobel Prize. And since then you've had like um, Blink, uh, Black Swan, uh, Mistakes Were Made, Dry, Predictably Irrational, yeah. How We How Decide, all these books. Uh, and then culminating, I think this like last year we had uh, finally Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, um, Invisible Gorilla, my book, all that stuff came out all at the same time. You can see there's more of them as we go forward. That movement is all about uh, pulling away from the idea that we're all that human beings are deeply rational super uh, supermen, you know, of uh, of reason, and and returning to the concept that we have two systems of thought: one that's sort of automatic and prone to bias and everything, and one that's um, that is that takes over that system and makes long term choices and. Uh, is um, rational in every way, but it's not as it doesn't come to the forefront as much as we think it does. So I think that that movement is really going to help um, change public sentiment, and you're going to see more and more books like this. And it's going to become sort of common sense. Once that becomes common sense that we think in these ways, it'll be easier to have those discussions and convince people of, uh, hey, uh, science says this, and uh, that probably is a better way of looking at it than what your uh, what your brother-in-law says. <laughs> Maybe it should require, like, all the uh, politicians to actually have, like, you know, all these books in their library. I am continually amazed that uh, politics and science uh, rarely uh, hang out with each other, and uh, the, the policies are not created with any of this stuff in mind. It, it blows my mind. Um, I mean, we've known forever that eyewitness testimony is not reliable. Science has uh, – we have – Lots of research that shows that eyewitness testimony is a horrible thing to depend on, yet there it is, still in the legal system. So um, we have a long ways to go, but I think that we are moving forward faster and with uh, longer strides than ever before. I, I blame the fact that we all, as humans, believe our eyes so much that we just can't imagine being other any other way. It's, well, they saw that. It must be true. Yeah, that's why I hope um, that I'm just one little pebble in this uh, avalanche of, uh, of re-examining uh, the human condition and, and applying more humility to it, applying uh, a, a better sense of, um, 
uh, of our shortcomings. And when you pl- when you expect human beings to be a certain way from the get go, you won't create policies that assume people will save for retirement, or they will abstain from sex, or they will uh, do any manner of things that we assume they will based off of this better angel vision we have of human beings. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't aspire to uh, be this uh, ideal person, but uh, I think when you create political policies and personal policies that um, that accept our shortcomings from, from the first notion that uh, they're better policies and they're better strategies for being a person. Yes, I, I agree. And this is one of the things I remind people all the time is that, you know, politics and politics, uh, and religion and science, they're all smushed together if you like it or not. So <laughs> you have to make it so that the most logical outcome actually happens. And I think that all of our mental fallacies make it so difficult and it doesn't really, I mean, what do we do to solve that problem? And, and it would be good for um, the skeptical movement to, look inward and see, okay, is everyone here in this movement, um, is everyone here have, um, is no one in this movement, uh, is everyone in this movement uh, out of debt? Is everyone in this movement have um, uh, glistening, perfect uh, muscular bodies? Is everyone in this movement uh, um, this, that, and the other? Uh, had a, and see that all of us are, are fighting against these, um, these natural states of mind, these, uh, these built-in stumbling blocks. And that um, by not being above them and by sort of uh, embracing that part of our humanity, it's really helpful to push them forward a um, a message of saying, okay, we know that people tend to see faces whenever there are no faces. So, and because we have a little bit of our brain that is designed or that is uh, not designed, <laughs> a little bit of our brain that is uh that has evolved to see the human face and recognize it whenever we can. That's why we see things in clouds and that black socket looks like face. Therefore, probably that uh, shimmering image in, in the window is not the Virgin Mary. Sorry. Um, it's a lot easier to push that message out there if people already accept that we're prone to doing certain ridiculous things and that our, that our minds were, you know, spent a long time evolving in a completely different environment than they're in now. And uh, because of that, we are prone to certain ways of seeing the world. Exactly. So where can people find your blog, your website, or, or shun the thought on you and, like, they can find you on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I keep, my, I keep my Facebook private, but uh, I do have a youarenotsosmart.com is the blog. Uh, I have a You Are Not So Smart Facebook page, You Are Not So Smart Twitter account. I have a personal Twitter account that's just David McCraney. Uh, I'm also on Google Plus as David McCraney. Uh, but you can find all that stuff uh, at the website, youarenotsosmart.com. Are you going to be at any conferences or doing book signings or anything like that? Uh, I've done, I've sort of already, uh, the tail end of the promotional part of this, uh, this book, I'm actually working on a second book right now. Um, and we're, um, uh, and all sorts of other things related to maybe, uh, you're not so smart, actually might become a television show in the future. Um, and I'm enjoying the idea that I'm able to, that somehow I have, um, I've been able to pull this message out into the mainstream in, in sort of a, um, uh, sugar-coated way. The, I'm going to be at the, uh, Being Human conference in, uh, San Francisco in March, um. And I'm going to be speaking in at Ohio State University later on in the year, uh, but um, nothing in, in the immediate future. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, man. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. David's personal website and the website for his book, youarenotsosmart.com has tons of great skeptical information and links to extra information on fallacies, biases, and his own blog entries about all the skeptical things he is interested in. We here at Skepticality have to send out a big thank you to the few people who took the time and money to help support the show in the past couple weeks. It really does make a difference. Keep in mind that you can find the links to everything we talked about in this episode in the show notes on our website, skepticality.com. Thank you.
Join our discussion forums at www.skepticality.com. Leave feedback by email at feedback at skepticality.com or by phone at area code 206-888-HOAX. That's 206-888-4629. This has been Skepticality. Thanks for listening.